الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علیہ نبی محمد ولا علیہ وصحب وسلم اما بعد حبت اللہ کوشچن واز آس بردر کین یو پلیز کلیئرفائی وٹ یو مین بائی وٹس گوئنگ آن ان یمن اور ادر مسلم کنٹریز از نتھنگ لائک دا ریالٹی ان امیریکا اور ادر نان مسلم کنٹریز اینڈ دیٹ دا فک ڈزنٹ اسٹے دا سیم ان دوز پلیسز First, I would first advise, go back to what I said and listen again and make sure that you've quoted everything properly and in its proper context. The second thing I would say is anybody who studies fiqh and uh, deals with uh, the reality of the world and looks back at the history of Islam, beginning with the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and the issues of fiqh and the issues of ijtihad and the issues of fatwa, We realize that uh, scholars have always throughout time changed fatawa and ijtihad is open. Also, likewise, as in the beginning of Islam, meaning the, with the revelation, advent of revelation, uh, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, we see that the Quran was revealed in stages. And we see that different situations uh, changed. For example, at, there was a time when it wasn't necessary, it was prohibited to drink, uh, come to the Salat drunk, but not just being drunk outright. That wasn't prohibited at that time. So it shows us there was also a time when the muta was permissible. That's fiqh, that's ahkam, but then it became impermissible. So it had a reason why it was legislated and a time... Uh, And a, a very time in a very various circumstances, which later became abrogated from other circumstances. So that's from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Then we get through the rest of the history. And now we're talking about 1400 years later. So it is constant that there's ijtihad. And, that, and as I mentioned prior to this, that there are things that are fixed, like Aqidah. We don't say, oh, now uh, Tawheed is irrelevant, or now there's no Tawheed or... <coughs> Or now there's this or that or some other shirkiyat beliefs. No. Now it's okay to celebrate the Prophet's birthday and have a birthday cake and put candles on it and sing. No, we don't say that because that wasn't from the sunnah. So when that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about issues of aqidah and menhajia. Okay? But we're talking about more so that, as Imam bin Uthaymin mentions about uh, in his book on Asul of Fiqh, He mentions um, about that akthara akam afiq vaniya. Most of the rulings uh, in fiqh are based upon what is overwhelmingly viewed as correct. What's the difference? When we talk about the Quran and issues of Aqidah, it's not vaniya. You know, this is something that is. Uh, that we're sure of, yaqiniya, this is ilm yaqin, you know, that we believe, khalas, there's no room for playing with that. We don't say, uh, you know, we believe overwhelmingly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, or he's the only one worthy of worship. La, we say that with yaqin, with certainty, there's no doubt. That doesn't change. Whereas fiqh, ahkam, the reason we have so many differences, and why so many, so many differences are excusable in many circumstances, in fiqh, is because akthara ahkam kama qala ibn Uthaymin, most uh, the rulings, as Imam ibn Uthaymin mentions, as in and many before him, especially in the issue of sul of fiqh and stuff, referred to that most of the ahkam are, uh, they're built on what's overwhelmingly thought to be the evidence, what they believe is the strongest evidence. That's not wahi, that's not revelation. So I hope you can kind of get a grasp on that and you get better understandings of the things if you study some fiqh and you study usul of fiqh and qa'id fiqhiyya and, and these other sciences. That will give you a more well-rounded and, and study tariq tashri'i, you know, how the sharia uh, developed and was uh, uh, and, 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 and that process through history, the historical um, codification of fiqh and things like this and even aqidah. You know, even things when they became certain points or minhajia became uh, where it became uh, codified, 
that this was the way of Ahl Sunnah versus Ahl Bid'ah. So all of these things, these are very complex issues, but just to give you an, an understanding. So that's one aspect. Another aspect of this answer is, as I mentioned prior to this, is that, for example, the issue in Yemen. Yemen is a place, is a war, war zones going on, okay, in case you don't know. Yemen is not like Indonesia. Culturally, yes, they're both Muslim countries, but culturally, very different. Uh, very different situation. So culturally different, and their how, their condition right now is different. Indonesia is a stable country that has, you know, their own style of rulership and freedoms, okay? Yemen is in a war zone with a collapsed government, basically. And, you know, all kind of folda, all kind of chaos. Very different. So what's going on there and there? So now we understand what we mean by conditions are different. Therefore, obviously, fatwa are going to be different. What might be legislated in Yemen in their context is not legislated in Indonesia. So that's how you can see where fiqh is different there. Compare that to America. America is a so-called democracy, okay? But for all intensive purposes, we could say it's a country that has, that they have uh, more or less uh, a lot of freedoms and openness in, in some respects, <clears throat> which is a very different style of government than those other governments, more or less. I mean, Dem uh, Indonesia has more, more in common than with Yemen, okay? And other countries, countries that are kingdoms, countries that are uh, yeah, um, dictatorships or in all kind of various styles of governments, okay? Very different, the reality on the ground, okay? So their how, their condition is different. So therefore, when you're practicing and applying certain rulings and principles, they may or may not apply under those circumstances and in those localities. And that can change. There's, so, there's a whole body of, literature that we're open up in big doors but i'm just going to give you a very general answer so hopefully and try to give some small examples so hopefully that's clear let's look at what the initial question in the other video was it was about the minhaj of the uh du'at and stuff like this in the west so for example i'll just give you a difference i lived in yemen in saudi arabia a difference in the da'wah to ahl sunnah the salafi da'wah okay there are some differences not that the dawah itself is different, but how they how they uh, give dawah, some of the things related to their condition, related to their condition, related to related to the freedoms, because Yemen claimed to be sort of a, a, a it was a republic, okay. So there were certain freedoms that were allowed. So that means anybody could could get up and speak. You don't have those same openness in Saudi Arabia. It's very different. You have to get a license. You have to, you know, you know, there's a whole procedure, especially now, those things are changing. So you didn't have those same openness that you had in a place like Yemen where anybody, a Khan al was speaking, this group, that group, every sect could pretty much, you know, as long as you weren't too wild, I guess, out there, then you could speak. Okay? That shows it's a different type of environment with freedoms and what you can say so even ahl sunnah might have certain ahkam that they practice in one locality which differs in another government and in another country and characteristics of the dawah is in yemen it was very clear you know you had masajid that are if you want to say fairly restrictive as salafi masajid you know when you're going to this masjid, it's a khwani. You know that this one is Zaydiya, Shia. You know, the Zaydiya, Shia. You know that this one, you know, very distinct characteristics. So Ahl Sunnah is very, uh, the groups there are very uh, actively critical of one another. And they're very, and it's a more pluralistic society. So how they relate and how they interact and even the ahkam is different. What maybe they can say and do there, they can't do in another place. For example, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia doesn't necessarily have a masjid. You know, the masjids are not 
like if you want to say label the Salafi more or less. You know, there might be, there might be Salafi scholars they're teaching, but you might have other scholars which are not necessarily Salafi that have some other semi-orientation, even if they generally are going to uh, have Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah. But there may be some departure. So you don't have really the same kind of strictness. So there's going to be a difference in how you deal with Ahl Bid'ah. And there is. Some might, you know, you might have more government uh, where you go through the government body to deal with that. Yemen, no. They're going to say, hey, these guys can do what they want. They can do this sort of a free society. So even your refutations might be more, uh, more open and more, you might have more leeway there. Okay, so there's, so then that shows you <coughs> that can affect Akam. Okay, then you come to America. America also various groups and sects. Ahl Sunnah is li is few. Okay, Yemen you have a large number and Salafi Masajid all over Salafi places to study the Sunnah. Saudi Arabia likewise, it's uh, uh, you know the main creed that they propagate is the Salafi creed, the creed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Coming back, what was this, what was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Up uh, uh, and and the Salaf Asari, okay. That is the official creed. That's the official uh, uh, religion, if you want. That's espoused by the uh, the government. Whereas Yemen, no, Yemen was kind of secular, and then you had parliament, so you had various different things. I hope you get an understanding of what I'm trying to say here. That so there's going to be different ways of approaching in Yemen, for example. Uh, the Salafi Masajid, I'll give you the difference in Yemen, right? And this is a thick issue. In Damaj, you could wear shoes. Okay, Damaj was one of the only places at that time that I know of, in the time I was there, where you could wear shoes. I'd never seen that in my whole life, okay? Except for going there, where they go in, you have your shoes on, you wipe it after you came in the desert, you look, you inspect it for any najasa, they do like a wipe on the, <laughs> the thing, and then you just walk and pray on a carpet, sandy carpets. I never experienced that before. That was in Damaj, that was Akam, but other Salafi Masajid that had carpets, they didn't necessarily allow shoes because the general people, and that's from Fiqh, that's from understanding, that's from different Akam. Their situation was different. Damaj was a a, 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 a village, a and, and, and a small Salafi enclave within a province, you know, up in the mountains. They controlled it. It was their place. Imam Muqbil sat in his chair. Sheikh Yahya sat in his chair. They controlled that environment. Every you know, it's a Salafi establish if you were proven you know whatever some deviance came out you're out they kick you out you know it was they controlled it so they controlled what happened in the masjid and that was in accordance with the fatwa of imam muqbil okay he's saying the prophet sallam, they prayed in their sandals pray in your shoes pray in your sandals so people prayed in their sandals in sama in the salafi masajid you wouldn't pray in your shoes and your sandals you had to take them off you know because you're dealing with not just Salafis, they might control the masjid, but you're dealing with the general people in the main, in a, the city, the city center. So people, uh, you have all kind of different people there for, who don't know about these things. That's going to cause a mafasid. It's going to cause a harm to the people. The people don't understand that. They're going to say, what are you, you're disrespecting the masjid. They don't understand that. So they're, they're not going to practice and implement that in the same way. So I hope that's, that's a micro example also, and how you deal with the people of innovation. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, it differs from time to time. Sheikh Rabi, who's known for having a lot of uh, uh, strong words uh, about Ahl Bid'ah and, and others and so forth, <coughs> that he uh, even says on more than one occasion, you'll find this fatwa, you'll find it in some of his books, that of course, and we don't need to have it from the Sheikh. I'm just giving you an example because you might need that. But I'm just giving you an example so you understand because so many, the Salaf <laughs> practice this, okay, that you deal with the Mukhalifin, the people who deviate in different ways. And it's not always going to be the same, meaning there's going to be times when Ahl Sunnah is strong in a place. If they are strong, then it's more mashroor for them to make hajr, you know, from someone who deviates from the Sunnah, who's a caller to bid'ah, compared to when they are weak, they may have to 
they may not be able to practice those same ahkam. If you're you're in a tribal village and your sheikh is a mubtadi'a, he's a Sufi, but he allows you to spread the sunnah as long as you don't, you know, go too far away and speak ill about him or whatever, but you, you're calling to the sunnah and what have you, you're going to deal with him as a tribal elder and, and respect in a different way than if you were in a place <coughs> where you don't have that same relationship uh, and you may not, uh, you, it may be a, a person of bid'ah and you may, it may be mishru' to make hajr of them. So I hope you get an understanding of this, that sometimes uh, when Ahl Sunnah is strong, they have the power to do, to implement certain ahkam that they don't have the same power to do when they are weaker. And that differs with time, place, uh, and locality, and, and all of that. All of that makes a difference, and the conditions, okay? So hopefully that, that gives you some idea. And also, the, the for example, one of the examples from Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, as far as changing her ijtihad. And she mentions, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she mentions about, she said she made a, a fatwa basically saying the women should not go to the masjid. Okay, we know the hadith of the Prophet or, or uh, the Prophet said the, the women could go to the masjid. And in a hadith, it was mentioned, I think, by Ibn Umar, and he said, uh, somebody said, Wallahi, let them na You know, by Allah, I'm going to prohibit them because he's saying, you know, this is fitna. And then a uh, Sahabi, I think it was Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala, or one of the Sahaba, they responded, they said, uh, uh, we tell you that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed the women, and you say, wallahi li hunna? And you say, by Allah, you're going to prohibit them? Okay? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha had a fatwa where she changed. She said, if the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa I can't find the exact text, I had it a minute ago, if the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were alive now, I'm sure that basically I'm sure that he would prohibit the women from going to the masjid if he were to see the fitna and this and this and this that is happening at this time with the women more or less, you know, certain you know activity. Maybe they were kind of beautifying themselves or what have you. So this shows us that. Uh, this is a practice, ijtihad, of course, and the ijtihad has to do with ahkam, it has to do with rulings, and that ijtihad is going to change, it's going to change, now there's a new, this was during the time of Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala, and she said, uh, she said, lo adraka Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ma ahdatha nisa li mana'ahunna al-masjid kama mana'at nisa bani Israel. She said, if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were to see what the women are doing, he would prohibit them from the masjid, similar to the way the women of the children of Israel were prohibited from the masjid. And this you'll find in, uh, he says, uh, in Muhalla, Muhalla uh, Ibn Hazm. Okay, so the point being is fatawa change, t uh, time with time conditions and you have to look at all these things part of even giving a fatwa this is also fiqh if you get a ruling if you get a ruling from a sheikh and he says yep this is something this is halal or this is haram or he says that you know yes you should do this you should boycott so and so but he doesn't know anything about so and so but he just trusts you and he makes a hukum okay we know going back to the fiqh that the scholars say a hukum ala shay far'in ala tasawrihi that part of a ruling on something is that you have understanding of it that's part of the ruling you can't make a fatwa or talk about someone or what a ruling on something or someone and you don't know anything about it a hukum ala shay far'in ala tasawrihi part of a ruling on something is having an understanding of it so that shows us that, uh, of course, fatawa can be wrong, and this is from the ijtihad, but the point we're trying to drive home is different circumstances, different environments, different time periods. All of that has to be considered when applying fiqh. As long as we're not, we're not talking about uh, the assassin of the deen or usul al-deen, like we're not saying, oh, 
you're, you live in America, you can't pray. That's not what we're saying. So please make sure you have a clear, you're clear, clear on that. We ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil.